Great job, worship team. Thank you guys for serving us well. They've been serving us extra well because they're coming extra early to do two services so that we can care for our church. We're so thankful for you guys. The first car that I ever owned in my life was when I was 16 years old, growing up as a kid in Virginia Beach. It was a hand-me-down from my father. It was a 1984 Toyota Camry. It was like ugly gold, rusty color. It was the point where the rust kind of looked like part of the color. And that's not an insult, Father. If you're watching online, thank you for the car. But it was so bad, it was getting holes in it from rust. Anybody ever had a car like that? It was, rain was coming in whenever it would rain. And me and a few of my buddies at school realized, what are we gonna do? I can't pay to get this thing repaired. It wouldn't be worth it. Let's just duct tape these holes shut. Duct tape solves solves everything. And so while we put duct tape over a few of the holes, we realized we should just cover this entire car with duct tape and give it like a facelift. So we bought a bunch of rolls of black duct tape and a few rolls of silver, and we stayed up all night meticulously covering every inch of the car, even coming around every corner, under, over, all black with a silver racing stripe down the middle. And by the end of it, it looked like a brand new paint job. And when you got close to it, it was even cooler because you realized it was duct tape. It was called the Duckmobile. It was famous at my high school. It helped me pick up the ladies, if you catch my drift, pre my wife. That, that was kind of a joke. Yeah, it's true, but it, whatever. And at stoplights, I'll never forget, I'd be driving and waiting for the light to turn green, and there'd be cars all around rolling their window down and asking, is that duct tape, and pointing at my car. It was the greatest. I was living it up. I was probably, um, my head was getting big because I was getting all this attention for it. Then the summer came, and the, the sun started beating down on the duct tape every single day. This was in Virginia Beach, so it gets a little hot, and you can probably guess what started to happen. The sun started to melt the glue behind the duct tape, and gradually all the tape collectively started sliding down the car. So it became a giant mess of melted glue. We had to spend more time getting all the tape off the car, and then it was just looking horrible. The holes were back, the engine was dying anyway, and we got the thing towed. So that was my first car, the Duckmobile. My second car was right after that, and the first one I bought with my own money, it probably cost me, I think, a 1000 or 1500 bucks that I saved up from working, worked at Dairy Queen, painted some houses, and bought a, uh, an 86 Toyota Celica red, two-door. Loved that thing, worked for a little while, then it broke down. Eventually upgraded to something that was from the 90s, that was fun. And then I, in my, I think it was in my young 20s, for the, first time I ever, uh, for the first time ever, I got a new car. Now, it was a lease, but it was still new. It had like 5,000 miles on it or something like that. So I guess it wasn't brand spanking new. But you know that feeling when you get into a new car and it's yours? It feels awesome, doesn't it? Something about new is great. I also love when I get a new guitar or like a new keyboard doing music, or I love even getting a new book. Anybody here love a brand new book and how the cover feels and how the pages feel? It's one of the things that we all mourn about digital books, which are nice, but you lose the newness. Even a new Bible is awesome. I love getting new socks, uh, anything new. So there's this bit that Jimmy Kimmel does, and I'm gonna, my mom did not want me to share this story, but I'm gonna share it Mom, if you're watching this, I'm throw, I feel like I'm, I've just insulted my mom and my dad in the first five minutes of the sermon today. They're amazing, but this is a great story. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel has this bit where he has his staff members read funny texts from their parents. So things that just make their parents sound hilarious or maybe out of touch or something like that. And I said, I don't think I have any texts like that from my mom or my dad, this particular bit was mom. So I went and looked at the text thread with my mom that's still just in my phone, and I found a picture of, I think, six pairs of underwear laid out on a bed, and it said, Nathan, and this was just last year, Nathan, your dad got these new pairs of underwear. He only used them once or twice, and he doesn't want them. Would you like me to give them to you? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh, I could totally, I just need to send this to Kimmel. Uh, when I saw her this summer, I told her about that, and she was so embarrassed. I, I, I looked back on the thread, and when she sent me that, I just never replied. It didn't even warrant a response. And she said, Nathan, promise me you will delete that text to never share it with anyone. So I still have the text, and I just shared it publicly 
at our church and online. No one wants used underwear. We love new underwear. Uh, New is always good, but you guys know this uh, because you've lived enough life. It's only new for a couple weeks. Cars get dented, uh, instruments get old, books get worn out, socks and underwear get used up, you get holes in clothes, and new is temporary. It doesn't last long. But today, we're going to look at a promise from God's Word. We've been studying the promises of God this entire year, and it's a different kind of new. This is the kind of new that brings radical and life-altering, destiny-shaking transformation that lasts. So it is a new that remains new. And it's going to start a series for us called Missio Dei, which means the mission of God. And the title of today's message is The New Creation. I'm going to give you a bit of context. Bear with me for a second so you can help understand when we're reading this promise in the scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Corinthians was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, which is a city. Corinth was the third most important city in the Roman Empire at the time. Corinth had a population of 80,000 with another 20,000 in surrounding villages and settlements. Corinth was prosperous, cosmopolitan, and religiously pluralistic, a lot like our nation today. It was accustomed to visits by impressive traveling public speakers and obsessed with status, self-promotion, and personal rights. Corinth was a city known for its extravagance and wealth. The church at Corinth was known for its extremes as well, so the church that was in Corinth. In, in his two letters to the church, Paul confronted, confronted fighting, jealousy, sexual impurity, unresolved conflict, and a host of other issues. And one overriding issue was the idea that Corinthians thought way too highly of themselves. They were the Corinthians. They were arrogant, proud, and better than the rest of the world. It wasn't just true in the city, but that sense of pride and entitlement worked its way into the church. And in Paul's first letter, he strongly dealt with sin and pride. It's called 1 Corinthians. Some people responded with repentance and change, but many had a different reaction. Paul and his authority were under attack. His love for the Corinthians was questioned. His teaching was challenged. This letter, 2 Corinthians, was Paul's response to those attacks. It is loving, inspiring, and filled with blessing, comfort, and thanksgiving. Paul's goal was to rally the Corinthians around Jesus, his love, and their purpose and mission as followers of him. He wanted the arguing and fighting to stop and the church to move forward in unity. We pick it up in chapter 5, verse 13, and it helps us understand um, I think there are some similarities to our entire nation, us as Americans, that are similar to the city of Corinth. And then any of our major cities in this country could, to some degree, be compared to Corinth, including Nashville and the surrounding areas. Starting in verse 13 of chapter 5, he says this, If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So the critics were saying, Paul is crazy. And his answer was, yes, I'm crazy. I'm crazy about following Jesus, and I'm crazy about you, his people. We know this. When you love others that are different, sometimes people think you're crazy. When you put other people first and sometimes sacrifice what you have, some might call you crazy. When you refuse to attack other people groups that others around you attack, some will call you crazy. If you're someone who takes your stimulus check and immediately gives it to someone else, some would call that crazy. Even the act of giving 10% of our income, some would look and say, that's crazy. When you dare to love while others around you hate, or when you respond to anger with love, it looks crazy. When you respond to injustice with forgiveness, it looks crazy. One of the first people that came to know Jesus when my wife and I were planting a church over on the West Coast was an elderly woman named Hazel. And she was, I think at the time, about 75 years old, African-American, beautiful woman, neighbor in our apartment complex, and for decades had been a struggling actress. Uh, So she dated back to the mid-1900s as an actress in Los Angeles. So as you can imagine, she had been through quite a bit. And she had not stepped foot in a church since she was 16 years old. And she had a real disdain uh, for the things of God because she had been hurt. Even when my wife and I were having new kids out there and we got to know her, she couldn't believe we kept on bringing new people into this world. So she just had that kind of view. 
And we didn't think that she would be the very first one that we got to lead to know Jesus out there, but she came to a Super Bowl party at our house. And she then came to the church that we were planting out there and she got radically saved and like born of the spirit of God. It was awesome. Uh, But the following year, our church felt like God was calling us to help plant some churches through a missionary that we were partnering with in the country of Somalia, one of the most war-torn countries over in Africa. And when we were singing Amazing Grace today with the worship team, um, for some reason, maybe because I knew I was going to share this story, I was remembering sitting around a fire with a few pastors and some of the locals over in uh, Tanzania in East Africa out on a you know, what felt like an open safari, but it was not an official safari area, praying about what God would have us do to love some of the people in this area that had no witness of the gospel. And the response of that trip that I was on was our little church plant committing $50,000 over the course of a year to help send these missionaries and develop a church presence in Somalia. And one of the primary givers Uh, to that project is someone who's still one of my closest friends and he was new at our church at that time, the art director for this video game, Call of Duty, which is a violent video game if you know of it. And ironically, it was royalties from Call of Duty that went to help plant a church in one of the most war-torn countries in the world, Somalia. Isn't that amazing? Hazel, though, was very new in the Lord and she was struggling herself financially and we did help her, but not to the tune of 50,000. And she really struggled with the radical generosity. She really struggled with the fact that we were giving away that much money for people around the world for something that she didn't fully understand. And she didn't realize that we wouldn't even have been there in her life sharing the good news if we wouldn't have already started giving sacrificially just to be there in Los Angeles. Sadly, it got in her head so much that she left the church over it. We were heartbroken about it, but you can can take it to the bank. Radical displays of generosity look crazy and are sometimes an offense to people. Mary in the scripture broke a bottle of perfume on the feet of Jesus to anoint him before he went to the cross. And the scripture tells us that that bottle of perfume was worth a year's wages. And people were offended at the radical generosity does not mean we should not live with radical generosity. Does not mean we should should live our lives as a broken offering and as, as a poured out fragrance unto the Lord. And the reason, if we read on in verse 14, is this, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Christ's love compels us to do things that seem crazy. One of our new missionary partners that I'm going to share with you about today, their names are JT and Rachel Espejo, and they are going actually to a similar area uh, by chance with the story we just shared over in Somalia to a country called Djibouti. If the kids were in here, that would have got a laugh. Have any, how how is, how are things going in Djibouti? (laughs) I've been there and it's not a place that you would want to visit, let alone live. It's blistering hot, but it's also in a lot of economic ruin. And there's a lot of people there that have no witness of the gospel of Jesus at all. It is war-torn as well. There's violent terrorism and divided people groups. And uh, these, this young couple that's in their young 20s that normally would be thinking about building their career path, figuring out how to buy a home, settling down, things like that, instead are moving over there just to share the love of Christ with Somalis. And we are a part of their prayer team and support team. Earlier this year, at the beginning of the pandemic, when economics were even more uncertain, there was an open door to help free some, some women and kids that had been sexually trafficked because in India, due to the pandemic, they weren't having the income like they were as usual. So they were freeing some of them, which was, had never happened. It was unprecedented, but they had no education and no food and nowhere to live. So we took a quick offering with no am- announcements at all and gave over $6,000 to help do that, partnered with a few other churches and gave over $340,000 in a split Sunday because of an opportunity from our partners called Project Rescue over in India. And that is radical generosity that looks crazy. Why? Because Because Christ's love compels us. Now, if you read on in verse 14, I'm sorry, in verse 15, it says, and he, Jesus, died for all. Paul was saying that to the Corinthians because the Corinthians were not yet sure that Jesus had died for all. At this point, they didn't think that Jesus had died for those that were not Jews. What what does Jesus have to do with these Gentiles over here? And 
To this day, in many places of the world, there is a localized religion, which you guys are aware of. If you live in Israel, you're expected to be a Jew. If you live in Thailand, you're expected to be a Buddhist. If you live in India, you're expected to be a Hindu. If you live in Saudi Arabia, you're expected to be a Muslim. It's kind of part of the culture, part of being brought up there. It's what you do, but Christianity is different than that. Christianity was never intended, nor is it localized. Christianity has nothing to do with America or Tennessee. Paul says that one man died for all, for every person. So the gospel is not American. Christianity is transcultural. It fits everywhere and into every nation, crosses every border, crosses every time zone, every language barrier, every socioeconomic class, every political barrier, because one man, Jesus, died for all people everywhere. It is the life-changing truth of Jesus that goes to every culture, every tribe, every tongue. The same Jesus touches people's lives in Franklin and in Alaska and in Los Angeles and in Thailand. And the the first point today, and they're going to go quick today, is Jesus is not a savior. He is the savior. He is the way, period. If you study the religions of the earth, you find out quickly Christianity is nothing like any of the other religions, which all say you need to ascend the mountain by doing these works and by getting things right and by doing this and that. Christianity is the exact opposite and is the only time that God, the Savior, comes down the mountain to the people. It's called the incarnation of Jesus. He becomes one of us in order to reach us. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Reading on in verse 14. I'm gonna recap 14 and 15 and then reading on. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So when you meet Jesus, it changes your goals. It changes your objectives. It changes your priorities. And then in verse 16, so in light of the fact that Jesus died for all men, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We have to be careful with that as followers of Jesus, especially in a year like this. We are not called to regard any person from a worldly point of view. Greg Boyd says it this way, as a follower of Jesus, you're only allowed one opinion of a person, that they have infinite worth and Christ died for them. We're only allowed that opinion of any person. And I wanna submit to us, I I believe we are in a strategic moment in a strategic region for what needs to happen in this next generation. You know, we're in a massive political divide. We're in an election year and we have a lot of people, a a lot of young people getting disillusioned about the faith because they see followers of Jesus over-identifying with things that have nothing to do with Jesus and the higher allegiance of the kingdom of God. One example would be socialism. And I'm not gonna get political here. This is just for the sake of example. My guess is a lot of you here would not call yourself socialists, nor would you want the country to go in the direction of socialism. And I'm not making a political speech here or an endorsement of any sort because my position is apolitical. We have a capitalist nation. We're living in a lot of blessing from that. There's challenge from that as well. But we have a lot of young people who I've been around that have become very convinced. Maybe they wouldn't say they are entirely socialist, but they would definitely say they are uh, socialist capitalists, and they're, they're, they're submitting a new version of how they want to see America. And some of the older Christians, we, and I put myself in that category, have to be careful not to disengage from them about our most important task and responsibility to them if we completely disagree with what they want to see the country become. Let me say it this way. A young person in Franklin, Tennessee, that would say I am the, the greatest mission of my life is to see America become a socialist nation, needs to know that they have a place to come sit right here at Graceland Church, and our whole heart towards them is gonna be to introduce them to Jesus and the kingdom of God in an entirely different way. Very important. My, the first thing I wanna say to that person should not be, here's the hundred reasons why we should not become socialist. That should not be my first agenda. My first agenda should be the aroma of Christ, the kingdom of God, here's what, and you, you know why I'm so passionate about this? Because if all these young people were my kids, that's what I would want the Christians to do. Like get the message right. <laughs> I have four kids and, and they're gonna get affected by our culture. And they're gonna, our young people, especially because of social media and things like that, they are discipled by our culture. And we have to 
continue to figure out ways to be in a trusted, open relationship with them so that we can disciple them in the ways of the kingdom of God and in the ways of Jesus. And that starts with being obsessed as Christians with the higher allegiance of Jesus. Are you tracking with me? I've had a lot of experience with this. I pastored in LA for a lot of years. Everyone that we got through our doors there had certain beliefs and strong convictions about everything. And you take them and you love and you, and you pray and you serve and you disciple. And this area we're in right now, as you guys know, has, has both worlds colliding, has generations colliding, has political views colliding. And our church needs to get very comfortable with being a very diverse body of all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of, we need to be very comfortable with the mess of the reality of our lives and what we're all about. Are you guys tracking with me on this? It is important that we get this. This is not unique to America. This is the message of Jesus. This was happening in Corinth. And the promise that this all leads up to in verse 17 is this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This is something that needs to be proclaimed and given to every single person. If you here are in Christ, I encourage you to remember, number two, you are a new creation, so live like it. God has made you new. All the sins and mistakes of your past erased. The specific places of guilt and shame that you may even feel right now sitting here, God replaces with his glory and his grace. How amazing is that? This is the gospel. All the junk and crud he replaces with his goodness and his love and his faithfulness. You are a beautiful new creation. And just before chapter five in verse four, verse 16, it says, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So not only are you new now when your faith is in Christ, but you are renewed day by day. I need that every day. How many of you guys are just willing to say, I need renewal day by day in my life. I have an issue with my eyes that I've had to get to know over about the last 10 years where at night um, they dry out completely. Um, I had eczema as a kid. It seems to be kind of related to that. And the, the, the byproduct of that that destroyed me a, a few times is when I wake up in the morning, if, if I get jolted awake, which I have four little kids, so that happened a lot. If I get jolted awake, my eyelid would be stuck to my eyeball and would cut my eye. So I would wake up to, ah, and then it would absolutely destroy me. It would take weeks to heal. I'd have to go to the doctors and we couldn't get a handle on it for a long time and it just kept on happening. And you know what I do now is every single night I have to put literal ointment in my eyes. It's like, you know, you know like bacitracin that you put on cuts? It feels just like that. I have to put that all over my eyeball every single night. And then every single morning, the very first thing I do in the morning, number one, is I'm very, I now in my subconscious, my, my, my body has kind of taught itself to when I wake up to think about my eyes and I actually don't open my eyes. I go, I don't open them with just my eyelids. I go and I slowly open each lid and then I go straight to the bathroom and put drops in my eyes. And ever since I've been doing that every day, I haven't had one of those major lacerations. And I now, it reminds me of the daily work of being renewed it reminds me of the daily invested investment needed to have a flourishing relationship with God. Just like with a spouse or with a friend or anything like that, it is a daily process to be renewed and tell God, you are my focus. Your word is what I want in my heart and mind. Guess what happens if you don't do it every day? It's not in there, right? Guess what happens if I don't smear stuff all over my eye at night, which I hate doing? I get huge cuts on my eye. So it's worth doing. Daily renewed. Stay in the process. And then it all leads up to verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Number three, the message of reconciliation has been committed to you, and to me. It's not a message that he has called other people to take care of. It's a message that he has given to you and has asked you to share with the people around you. If you've ever longed for a meaningful life or a purposeful life, this is it. There is a reason you are here. There is a reason you're in relationship with everyone you're in relationship with. Number four, as followers of Jesus, missions is not an option. 
It is our assignment. I talked last week about how Jesus is the first missionary. He is the sent one. And if we are to walk with Jesus, we will be missionaries. It doesn't mean we have to go to Africa. It means it's how we live right here and right now. I love the language of one of our values, renewal. God is at work in the world, reconciling all things to himself through the gospel of Jesus. We get to be a part of this renewal project through how we work, how we love our neighbors, how we raise our families, and how we participate in local and global mission. And it's why we live out this mission, following Jesus and loving our neighbor for the good of the city. And it's why we live out this vision. May we be a diverse and enduring church focused on the mission of God and building a land of grace, hence the name Graceland. And God has entrusted us and positioned us with a bunch of acres right here in this strategic spot in this city at this time so that we could give ourselves to what God wants to do here and be faithful with what he's entrusted us with. Every year at some point in the fall, we have a missions focus. It's really all year, but the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the mission of God. Part of it is financial because we support a lot of missionaries and projects, but more than that, it's about your life being surrendered to the purposes of God. It's a chance to say, yes, again, Lord, that the, the, the highest priority of my life is your priority, not mine. The highest goal of my life is what's your goal? And the church really doesn't have a mission. The church is the mission of God. We are the vehicle for him to fulfill what he is doing in the world. Um, just quickly, here's some of our existing missions partners that we partner with financially, and if they're local, we sometimes serve with, and soon we'll start doing trips to some of these partners. I'm not even going to read them all right now. You'll be getting, over the course of the next couple weeks, um, handouts. It'll be on our website, too, explanations of all these, and those 14 additional missionaries in 11 nations all have incredible stories, and today I'm introducing you to a few others. One generation away is a new partner, and Lauren uh, Robinson, who is our treasurer and on our board here, is also on their board, and they've served closely together for a while. They distribute healthy food to families throughout Middle Tennessee that currently do not have access to food sources due to economic and physical barriers. I've had multiple mutual friends with, is Chris his name, Lauren? With Chris, um, telling me we need to connect because he he does a lot of his work based out of here in Franklin. And tomorrow I'm getting coffee with him and we're going to dive in to figure out how God has called us to partner with One Generation Away. I already told you about JT and Rachel Espejo and then Bobby and Lindsay Clayton are another one that we picked up this year. They're going to Western Mongolia, an area made up of nomads, orphaned children and widows who have never had a witness to the gospel. And this young couple, by the way, had their first kid two years ago and their second kid is due this week. And once they get uh, their, their legs under them with this new kid, they hit the road out to the jungle to love people, to share the love of Jesus, and we are part of their prayer and support team. Isn't it an honor to be a part of God's mission around the world in this way? It's beautiful. The, the stories that come back, I'll try to share as many as I can with you throughout the year. The stories that come back are just incredible. And it's important to remember and note, we do not participate in the mission of God out of obligation. We do it because it, how, how can we not? Christ's love overflows from our life. It's an invitation. I, I always picture God as like basically saying, come on, come on in, come on with me. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about the river of God and just this, his spirit and, and the sense of being uh, surrendered in the current of a river is my goal for my own life. And it's my goal for our church family. And it's meant to be a joy. Yes, it's hard. Yes, challenges come. Yet last week we talked about the promise of trouble, but that we can take heart because Jesus has overcome all the source of that trouble. Trouble will be there, but we're meant to have joy. Yesterday, um, I was home with my three youngest kids watching a great movie called Christopher Robin. Has anybody seen it? It's, it's Winnie the Pooh, and it's about Christopher Robin, and he gets old, and he forgets all the joy of his friends, and he forgets his imagination. He gets consumed with work. Probably a lot of us have been in those shoes. And I was sitting there with my, my eight, five, and two-year-old enjoying that. And of course, in the middle of it, my two-year-old got bored. It's not a super kid movie. And he started playing a game where he wanted to go to one side of the house. And then he wanted me to yell on, on your mark, get set, go. And then he would run as fast as he can and just dive bomb into the love seat in front of us across the living room while we watched. And once he did it once and got kind of my response, then he did it like of course, 30 times in a row. And then before we knew it, 
uh, Nessa, my five-year-old, joined him. So now I was counting for both of them. We can barely hear the movie anymore. And this is what the movie is about. It's kind of like letting childlike living and laughter interrupt the reality of life and not losing that. And then my, my eight-year-old got involved. So eventually I stopped the movie and now I'm sitting on the couch screaming, on your mark, it's go. It's like not even a game. It's just run across the house as fast as you can and dive bomb into the love seat. And of course, I'm hoping they're not gonna crack their heads together. And it's just, but here's the thing that really struck me. My son, who's two, he's the one who started it. And every time he would go back there, he would just eyes locked on me until I would say, on your mark, get set. Go, and then he would book it. And you know what I noticed? The whole time running full speed to the couch, guess what he was looking at? Me, with the biggest smile you can imagine, laughing, flailing his arms, and then dive bomb into the couch. And guess what he did as soon as he dive bomb into the couch? Look, look right at me, his dad. And I would clap and cheer. Yeah, that was awesome. Do it again. And he would run back over and he would get to the door and he would look at me. And it just made me think, that this is so similar to us living out the mission that God has for us. It's just like God, our heavenly father saying, all right, stand over here, get ready, keep your eyes on me. This is, good. You're gonna, this is gonna be a fun, this is gonna be a fun run. Keep your eyes on me. You might trip and fall. You might hit heads with your siblings, but I'll help you. K- keep your eyes on me. And he's just like, on your mark, get set, go. And then we get to run full speed into this life he gave us into this gift, into this house he's paying for, in this living room filled with toys that he has blessed us with. And when we keep our eyes on him and realize his joy and his satisfaction in this run that we're having, we're overflowing with joy. We're head back, running through fields of grace, arms flailing, dive bomb into the couch, get up and look at him, and we have his blessing. We have his, the pleasure of our father. And what scripture actually says is we have the pleasure of God our Father because of Jesus and him taking our place. So before you even say yes to the mission, his love for you is unconditional. But we have the choice to say yes to the mission or not. So you can live kind of your own thing and, and just try to manipulate all the outcomes of your life and, and, and worry about how you're gonna be successful in, in, in the version of success that the world offers. Or you can say, Father, I wanna line up on the side of the house. I wanna hear you say on your mark a second, and I wanna run the race you have marked out for me and live this mission and keep my eyes on you and everything I have is yours. I, I'm, just, I'm just surrendered to it and you can walk in that kind of joy. But it is up to us. The unconditional love will be there, but it is up to us whether we run in the mission. And so my, my encouragement to you today, the challenge from God's word is to be reminded, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Not just me as a pastor, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. What scripture actually teaches is that my job as a pastor is to equip you for the ministry that he has called you to. And so my hope and prayer is that you'll hear the voice of your father saying, ready, set, go this morning. And get ready. You use your resources in a whole new way. Use your time in a whole new way. As you get into a Monday morning and think about your work week and everything that has to happen, there will be new priorities. There will be new objectives. There will be new things you'll be thinking about and focused on. I'm gonna ask the team to come up. We're just gonna sing the chorus and bridge of this song that says, yes, I will. And we're gonna take communion together as just our response If you can raise your hand, if you'd like a packet and you don't have one, they'll bring you one right now. Raise it up if you'd like the team to bring you a packet. Okay, it looks like everyone has one. Go ahead and take the cracker out of the top. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, scripture says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. So let's hold the bread and I'm gonna pray. And actually, if you're at home watching online, which we know know you're there, some of our church family, we're one church worshiping together. You can get a cracker, you can get a piece of bread, anything you might have around and you can get some orange juice or some water. It's not about the specific form of these elements. It's about the heart behind it and what it represents for us. So let's take the bread in our hand, church. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. And we make a personal, thank you for your body that was broken for me, that makes us whole. You bore the punishment that we deserved for the sake of our flourishing. We thank you for it. 
And today we eat of the bread together as we say yes to your purpose and your mission for our life. Let's eat together, church. And let's take the juice. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. Thank you that it it goes down into the deepest crevices of our heart and our soul. And the places that were once filled with shame and darkness, regret, and sin have been replaced by glory, replaced by beauty, replaced by your faithfulness, your goodness, and your love. We thank you that you have forgiven us and washed us clean once again today. And we're renewed day by day. And we say yes to you. Yes to your mission for our life. Yes to your saving work. And yes to your lordship in our life as we drink together. Let's drink, church. Let's stand together as we sing. Yes, I will. Team, if you'll lead us. That's our prayer, Lord. We say yes with our lives. We say yes with our voices, with our hearts, with the fullness of our minds. We lift our hands and surrender, God. And we we say yes by participating in this communion and remembering your sacrifice for us and what you have done. We say yes as a church family, God, to what you've called us to do here together. We say yes for the sake of our loved ones, God. We say yes for the sake of our neighbors, for you have called us to this ministry of reconciliation. And we may have no idea what to do or exactly what that means. So we pray that you would just be in us and overflow from our lives and help us to simply love those around us to share the message, to share this good news, to use our resources, to use our time, every bit of our lives for your purpose. That's it. And may we be just like my two-year-old son, running with abandonment, with our eyes focused on you, our heavenly father, and with joy on our face and joy in our hearts. And I pray that for each person today. We pray this benediction over you guys, and then we'll be dismissed. May the God of peace, who raised Christ from the dead, strengthen your inner being for every good work. And may the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and dwell within you this day and evermore. Amen. Love you guys. Have a wonderful afternoon. Good to see you all.